would like to introduce my friend who is our graduation celebration speaker today. Saranga Chandratilaka is a friend um, from the UK originally, but lives here in San Francisco. And I actually got to know him here in the US, but you'll hear from his accent that he's very English in a lot of ways. And it turns out that we're actually from a very, um, we're from the same part of the UK, um, which is close to, in between Manchester and Liverpool, I would say. He'll say Manchester, I'll say Liverpool, so we'll, we'll, we'll let's go in the middle somewhere. So Saranga is a technology entrepreneur and really is um, a big deal in the technology world and I'm sure he has lots of interesting things to impart to you today and I invited him because I, I, I think he's brilliant. So uh, without further ado, Saranga Chandratilaka. Definitely close to Manchester. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I've got my uh, few notes up here. So, to pull up. Um, so first of all, thank you very, very much um, for giving you, giving me some of your time, um, especially to all of you, um, friends, supporters, family of, of, of the graduates, obviously all the staff and faculty, but most of all, um, you guys, the graduates of 2013. Um, graduation, I think, is one of those very special moments of your life. You know, most of life, you end up living minute by minute, just sort of rolling from moment to moment, from conversation to conversation. And there, but there are those, those brief moments when you do, for whatever reason, sort of stop, take stock of what's happening, of where you are, and what you're doing, and, and think a bit about where you want to go in the future. And there's very few of them when you think about it, like you know, when you get married, when you become a child, it's those sorts of moments. And graduation, I think, is one of those moments. So um, the fact that you would um, <coughs> 10 minutes to talk a bit about some of my experiences is, is really special. I feel very humbled by the fact that, um, you, that you're happy for me to do that. Um, so if you've taken the time at all to read the little bio about me on the back of this thing, you'll, you'll know that I don't um, appear to have anything in common with um, <laughs> <laughs> My industry is not yours. Um, and although we're all graduates of one sort or another, we're very different types of graduates. Um, but I think there is a shared thread, and, and Alison thought there was a shared thread too, and that's why she invited me to talk today. And the shared thread that, that she identified and that I, I agree with is the thread of being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, to be an entrepreneur used to mean to start a business, start a company, and then take it to market. But today, I think the reality of the world is such that the idea of you know, jobs for life, um, of, of, of roles or positions that don't change, that progress um, step by step, no longer works. Most of us today know that we are graduating into a world where we will chop and change our jobs, our roles, our responsibilities. Um, though, you know, whether or not we see ourselves as an entrepreneur in the traditional sense, we'll certainly have to be entrepreneurial in the way we look at our careers and the path that we will take from where we are today to wherever we're going to end up in, in you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years time. Um, and it's really that that I want to talk about because although um, you know, our industries are very different and I imagine the paths we will take are very different over, li over life, I think there may be some of the interesting experiences that I've had that may be relevant to some of the ones that you have. Um, the way I want to do this was share a couple of stories with you. That's always the easiest way to talk about these things. Um, the first story I want to talk about was, was kind of when I was in your seat. So when I first graduated and started on my career. Um, for a long time, I'd always wanted to start a company. I didn't know what that really meant, I didn't know why, but I had this idea that starting a company, building a product, take, you know, selling it in some way, having a team of people that I work with was gonna be a good thing. So I went and did um, computer science at university and I graduated in 2000, which was the height of dot com boom, if you remember those days. And so in other words, a perfect degree to have at a perfect period of time to go and start a company. Um, so I had that all laid out. I um, was gonna come over to the US and work for a company here who was gonna help me understand, you know, I decided that I didn't know how to start a company myself, so I was going to go and learn it from other people first. And I had found a company that said that they would work me for two or three years and they'd give me the opportunity to go and do that. So I was all set to do that and I flew out to the US and I spent about three months living the dream, um, working and playing hard, meeting all these people who were starting companies and getting really excited by the whole thing. Um, and then, to cut a very long story short, I got this email, um, sorry, they brought in the company, saying we had to go to a company meeting. Uh, and we all went to a company meeting the next day, and I remember it vividly. I was sitting there with my croissant in one hand and my coffee in the other hand, 
Um, the CEO walked up to a stage, a bit like this, but a much bigger room because we had 3,000 employees. Um, and he said, he started to talk about something, and I don't remember what he said, but I do remember that at one point he just stopped talking, and the sentence I'll never forget was, I'm so, so sorry, there's no more money, two thirds of you have to go, I'm so, so sorry. And then he burst into tears and he ran out of the room. Um, so, you guys are experts in psychology, so you can probably analyze the nuance of the psychology going on at that point in time. I can just tell you it was really bad. <laughs> people screamed, people cried, um, some people said, I knew this was going to happen. Um, but, you know, it was interesting because it, it was a big kick um, to the summit for me, certainly. Um, within two weeks, I didn't just lose my job, but I had to go back to the UK because I had no ability to stay here. Um, and everything that I thought was going to work stopped working. And this was really the beginning of the dot-com crash. You know, this happened six months after I graduated, and, and it took out most of the companies that I thought I was going to join. So I had I went back home with my tail between my legs, trying to figure out what to do next. And then I ended up joining a company in the UK. Um, again, a software and technology company, but it had to be a large company now because all the small, interesting companies were going out of business and they weren't hiring anymore. So I joined one of these big ones, and I realised a few months in that it wasn't going to work because. I was never going to learn anything about being entrepreneurial, learning working for a large company. I was just progressing slowly, step to step, from day to day. Um, I'd seen the guy who started the company knock around. I, he looked entrepreneurial, but I couldn't figure out how to get to him. I asked my boss to see if I could get an intro, and he said, "No, there's no way that guy would want to talk to you. Why would he want to talk to you? You know, so it didn't work." So, so I, I decided that, that was going to be my goal. I was going to figure out how to get to talk to the CEO and founder of this company because I figured he, if no one else, would know something about being an entrepreneur. Um, and I monitored the situation very, very carefully. And what I realized was that he only came into the office two or three days a week. And if he came in, he always came in at exactly 10.30. I have no idea why. He came in at 10.30, which is after everybody else is already in the office. And he would always park his very nice sports car and walk into the building through the entrance area, into an elevator, go straight up the top floor, which is the floor that I happen to be on. We would all turn right, but he would turn left because that's where his office was. And then you'd go to his office, and that was it. That was all you'd ever see of it. So I figured I had to intercept this guy at some point in that process. So I kept analyzing what was going on. And then I spotted that every morning at about 10.15, the receptionist who was on our floor, the top floor, would go down at about 10.15 in the morning. She'd take the elevator down. She'd pick up a whole bunch of mail. And then she'd go back up to our floor to distribute it, because all the mail was delivered to the ground floor, and she had to do this. So I went and started talking to her. I befriended her over a few days. Um, and she admitted to me that she hated this part of her job. She didn't want to walk down the stairs every day. That wasn't what she was paid for. Um, and so after a while, I told her that, you know, I always wanted some kind of exercise in the office, so why didn't I take the mail for um, And so, you know, as you can imagine, I sort of got this agreed to, and I would go down the stairs. Um, I had to walk, because I had to pretend it was about exercise, right? So I used to walk all the way down, pick up all this mail, walk all the way back up. I was exhausted by the top, and then I'd give out all this mail. And I did this for nine weeks. For nine weeks, I went up and down these stairs with absolutely no upside whatsoever, um, except that I was slowly getting fit. Um, and, uh, and then on the ninth week, on the Wednesday, my moment arrived. Um, Mike, the founder of, of the company that I was working for, walked into the building and he was right behind me when I was picking up the mail. And I pretended that I hadn't seen or heard him. And I turned around, banged into him. He banged into me. All the mail scattered all over the floor. He apologized profusely. We both were on the floor. We had to pick up the mail. He gave me the mail. We then walked to the elevator, went up the elevator, and then we parted ways. And in those three minutes, I managed to have enough of a conversation with him that I convinced him to invite me to a meeting in two weeks' time. Um, and to cut a super long story short, it's already a bit late, but um, you know, that, that was the beginning of actually what was the, one of the most important professional relations that I've ever had. Um, Mike invited me to that meeting, and that meeting went well. Event, within two years, I was running his technology team out here in the US. Within three years, I decided I want to start my own company, and he was the biggest champion I could have possibly had, encouraging me to do it, and ultimately funding me, actually, for the first year or two when I started it. Um, so I had no idea, but the time I put into to figuring out his daily morning routine was actually incredibly valuable. Um, so that's the first story, you know, starting off. But the second story I want to share is a sort of similar sort of story. Um, this was a few years later. I'd started the company, and when we were originally started the company, we were building this amazing product that was um, a piece of software that sat on your desk, and it would bring information from different sources to you. Um, and we were doing really well, we had loads of brave reviews, blogs were writing about us, we had thousands of downloads, everyone was very happy. Um, and I landed this really important meeting with a guy called Jim Lanzo. 
Um, Jim is or was the CEO of Ask.com. If you remember Ask or Ask Jeeves, they're still the fourth biggest search engine in the world. And for me, that was like the biggest meeting I'd ever done. And the idea was that we could do this deal where he was going to take our technology and make it bigger and you know, make it accessible to many more people than we ever could. Um, so I walked in to meet Jim, really, really tall, really intimidating guy, um, and had this really important meeting. And two funny things happened. The first funny thing is that when a guy like Jim meets a a guy like me, what normally happens is he gets briefed. So the secret is his team will produce a document for him before the meeting even starts that tells him everything he needs to know about who I am, what my company is, what we're doing, and really what he has to say. He just sits there and smiles and kind of follows the script. You know? um, but for whatever reason, Jim didn't get his briefing that morning. So Jim walks into this meeting blind. He doesn't actually know who I am. He doesn't actually know what I do. And he actually had to sit there and listen and react in reality for once. Um, the second thing that happened that was funny is that I hadn't slept very much. So we spent the last two weeks launching a new version of our software. And I was in that state that you get into when you work too hard. I'm sure some of you remember this from recent history. Um, where, you know, you've been working so hard that you start talking. You can only really talk about and think about the thing you've been working on recently. Um, and I was in that mode, and so when I sat down and talked to him, I should have explained the entire product, but I didn't. I talked about just the bit that we've been working on for the last two weeks, because that was so front in my mind. Um, as a result, between me talking about this and Jim not knowing what I was supposed to be there for, he got completely the wrong end of the stick. I went there trying to pitch him this desktop product. He went away from it thinking that I was going to be selling him a product that would somehow search video content online, because that happened to be one of the little features that we were talking about this week. Um, and as the meeting ended, he stood up and he shook my hand and said, hey, Saranga, this is, this is awesome. We really need video search. If you guys can deliver this and it sounds like you can, then you know, we're your first customer. And I had this brief, I had this moment of realization as I shook his hand that you know, I had two options right now. I could set him straight and say, I'm really sorry, Jim. I you know, totally focused on the wrong thing. Actually, we do this. And, and then he'd probably walk away because I don't think he was interested in what we actually did. Or I could go with it and say, yeah, yeah, video search. That's exactly what we do, Jim. And see where that took us. Um, and I took the second option. I said, yes, I smiled. I said, yes, no problem. Six weeks, we'll have the product working for you. It'll be on your desk. Um, and then I had, of course, the nightmare of going back to the office, setting up a conference call, and telling the entire team that they had to drop everything they were doing and now start working on an entirely new product that they had nothing, knew nothing about. Um, again, you're the mental experts. So you can imagine what happened with the team that day. Um, but um, we lost a few people, but we got there. We actually launched the product, and the long and short of it is that it was actually the smartest move we ever took. And today, in the Valley, people call it the pivot, when a company changes direction completely um, on a given day. And, and we did just one pivot in our history, and it really, really worked. Desktop search, the business we were in before, floundered and fell apart, and everyone closed down the products. No one was really a success. Video search took off. It became a multi-billion dollar industry, and Blinks was one of the many successful companies within that. Um, so, you know, it was amazing to me how this, this, this moment of change happened in a completely unexpected way. There was no long-term strategy. There was no development of an idea. There was not even a, a whiteboard. There was just two people talking about something and a spark of realization that twisted the company. So what, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you all this because, like I said at the beginning, I think that um, you know, you're at this very special moment in your, in your lives. You're at that moment where you can take stock of what you have done and set goals for where you're going to go in the future. Um, I won't reiterate the usual advice that people give you at that moment in time. You know, people say things like, follow your passion, believe in yourself, you can do whatever you want to do, and all those things. They're all true, and you should do all those things, but you know, you know that already. If you don't, someone else is going to tell you. Um, what I'm going to tell you more is about how you get there. You know, you can set these goals, you can have these passions and these things you want to achieve, but it's the path from here to there that's the tough bit. Um, and I think that's the bit that becomes very, very entrepreneurial. Because you set a goal, and you, you, when you do this, you should set a goal that's, that's you know, decently um, uh, open and flexible because you don't know what the world's really going to be like in 20 or 30 years. Um, and then what you need to do is you need to set off and start to adapt the direction you're going in based on those goals and, and react constantly. Um, trying to boil down this entrepreneurial path is a really, really tough thing. Lots of people have tried, and it's a really difficult thing to figure out what the nuances are. Um, the best example I've come from is a, is a guy called Paul Graham, who's a sort of famous entrepreneur and investor. Who, who, what he said very, very simply is that good entrepreneurs are people who are relentlessly resourceful. Um, I love that phrase. Um, when I hear relentlessly resourceful, it fires off a million neurons in my brain because it really matches what I think my experience is. Um, you know, relentless is someone who, despite losing their job, doesn't let that get in the way of the goal they really want. 
um, resourceful is sitting there for hours stalking your CEO so you can figure out how to get stalked in three minutes. Um, you know, relentless is you know calling and calling and calling until you get that meeting with Jim Lanzo. Resourceful is going into the meeting and realizing that when he got the wrong end of the stick, actually he had a better idea and it's okay to change. Um, and then relentless, of course, is going back into the office and driving everyone until they actually get changed. So you know, these are the kinds of properties that I think you need to think about. These are the kinds of traits. That, that help you navigate the very, very, very path that you're going to go through um, over the next few years as you as you blossom into, into whoever you're going to be, whatever, whatever, whatever you're going to be. Um, so anyway, let me leave it at that. You know, congratulations again on graduating. Um, you've come very far in all of your lives, and you've just capped everything else that you've achieved with a very, very special achievement. Um, you should be very proud, and you should absolutely celebrate the moment. I can't possibly do it better than, than you just described. You know, taking a moment to realize where you are and what you've done is critical, and whether you do it now as a group, whether you do it individually at some point in the next week or so, it's something you should absolutely do. Um, but then, when you do look to the future, um, well, first of all, you know, let me welcome you to the life of being an entrepreneur, of being someone who takes control of the path that you will walk. Um, there are lots of challenges ahead of you, lots of lows, but there are also lots and lots of highs. There are lots of moments of unexpected opportunity, um, of unexpected joy um, and delight, really, when you achieve something that you didn't even realize you were setting out to achieve. Um, and as you do that, let me give you with the advice of be relentless, be resourceful, be relentlessly resourceful, and most of all, may you be successful.